so I've heard that gamers these days have no patience, so let's get right to it. Meet Travis Touchdown, a penniless dude in his late 20s that lives in a motel room with his cat, surrounded by anime figurines and luchador masks, and his ride is a bike that screams over compensation. One night, he meets a hot girl named Sylvia in the bar and she gives him a new direction in life, to become the number one assassin in the United States. And so, with a beam katana bot on eBay in hand, Travis embarks on a murder spree to kill the 10 killers for higher ranked above him. Why? For the kicks of it and to get his dick wet. I absolutely adore how fast the game gets into its groove, to the point where there is no build-up. Travis's first kill already happened in the trailer for the game, putting him at rank 11. All that is left is to crush the gates of the mansion that number 10 lives in and mow through his army of bodyguards. No More Heroes is a 2007 action game developed by Grasshopper Manufacture and directed by Suda51, whom you might recognize from previous titles reviewed here, The Silver Case and Killer7. However, this game is not part of the thematic series of Kill the Past like the other two, aiming for a completely different tone and theme. No More Heroes is a much more comedic and lighthearted in tone, to the point where the player is addressed directly in the opening cutscene. There are no serious ruminations on the nature of crime, the destructive power of the past or social engineered societies here. Just one shallow man with equally shallow goal in a town so vile and corrupt that it's bordering on a parody, but apparently Santa Destroy is located in California, so I'm willing to believe it's an accurate representation of some real town. Or is there more to it? Well, let's get into the gameplay first. No More Heroes is a fairly standard action game. Enemy blocks high, so you need to attack low and vice versa. Or you can stun them with a punch to then throw them with a wrestling move and block or dodge more incoming attacks right after. Or charge your beam katana attacks for a devastating room swipes. But be advised that things run on batteries and if you run out, you need to recharge it. And how do you get your big ol' laser sword from inactive to ready to go? Like that. There are two broad gameplay loops, the assassination and the downtime. The former is basically just an action game level, go forward until you reach a boss fight, then deal with that. Each level has a theme and gimmick of its own to spice things up, but the baseline remains the same. The downtime takes place in the open world of the town of Santa Destroy. You see, there is an entry fee to challenge someone ranked higher than you, and to get that dough you need to ride across town doing mundane jobs like collecting coconuts or killing a CEO of a pizza chain. You know he's a big quick, because his life is worth 10 coconuts. Aside from that, you can buy yourself some drip, upgrade your weapons or do deadlifts to boost your stats. The open world is quite desolate and there isn't much to do aside from that and collecting balls, which means it serves the exact same function as every other open world in a game. Yeah, you heard me, I'm speaking truth to power here! A few quick tips before we move on. The collectibles are visible on the minimap. It took me embarrassingly long to discover that. You only need to unlock all weapons to get a true ending, so don't worry about doing everything. Get the t-shirt you like and so on, but don't worry about grinding out cash for all of them. In fact, you won't even get the satisfaction of getting an achievement for getting all gold medals on side quests or whatever, at least on PC. Why? Because the PC port is a broken piece of shit. You can only play on a gamepad, the button prompts don't show up half the time, the baseball minigame is straight up busted because it depends on motion controls that you don't get on PC, half the achievement trackers don't work correctly, and the game outright crashes if you press buttons on this screen before you're prompted to. At one point, the game gave me control schemes for the Switch Joy-Con and I was like, wow, they didn't even try! If you can experience this game on literally any other platform, go for that. However, even then, a lot of details feel lost after the game was ported from the Wii. Like the fact the blade charging required you to literally make jerking motions with the Wiimote, or that the speaker built into it was used for scenes where Travis talked on his cell phone. Lots of small things like that, small pieces of wonderful synchronization between hardware and software lost the porting. While we're on negative, there also seems to be no way to change the target of your lock-on, at least not one I was aware of. As the enemies don't give you the courtesy of not attacking from off-screen, this can be irritating, especially in side missions where you have to clear out a room with a single pixel of health. Locking on by itself makes you block in all directions, but the lack of camera control is really detrimental. With that doom and gloom out of the way, I love the presentation of this game so much! 
The designs of all major characters just shine, giving every assassin and civilian with a speaking role unique flair, making them all feel unique and larger than life. The art style itself aged very gracefully, with popping colors and pronounced shadows, and the UI being all gamer brain pixels and voxels really gives the whole thing a unique sense of personality. The music is great, once again, every assassin is given a unique theme, giving flavor to their fights, while most of the game uses the same catchy melody with slight remixes for every level. The game took me around 12 hours to beat, and in that time the music remained fresh and fun which is honestly a big achievement for a game of this budgetary scope. That style is the biggest part of why the game was enjoyable for me, and that extends to the story, which is full of contrast, same as the art style. All assassins are these colorful, eccentric figures, portrayed in a tongue-in-a-cheek way, but their deaths are always portrayed as an unpleasant or even tragic, given the gravitas of a beloved character passing. We are not given enough time to see more than a glimpse of who they are, and each time we cut that time we could spend with them short, it's portrayed in an unglamorous way. And in the center of it all is Travis, who is, for lack of a better term, an absolute fucking loser. To say that he is portrayed like a total chode by the camera would be an understatement. Every open world segment starts with him being called by a local video rental that he has to give back some porn tape that he's overdue on, only to then receive a threatening voicemail that he has to pay the next entry fee as soon as possible, or else. You see him with his pants down several times, as saving the game involves, quite literally, taking a shit. I particularly love how every scene transition is complemented by this coolest guitar riff, no matter how unflattering the actual scene. Got your ass kicked? A girl hung up on you? But there's also genuine warmth to his character that shines through sometimes, most notably every time that you get to play with his cat, Jin. And as much of a joke as he is, he is a capable killer. All it takes is one look at the bloodfest of the main gameplay loop to attest to that. Which is to say, the game is a joke, but all good jokes have a setup and a punchline that are based on something true. And to get to that truth, we need to delve into spoilers. If you'd rather experience the story fresh for yourself, go to this timestamp to avoid me talking about plot-specific bits. However, I am 2137% sure that you were already spoiled. Now, trust your force and head for the Garden of Madness. Moe. Okay, so two things need addressing here. One, the whole UAA thing was a grift and a scam, designed to funnel money out of Travis while also getting the other assassins killed off. Two, it's not just Travis that is the loser here, it's everyone, except for Sylvia, Jean and maybe Henry. Everyone got played like a bloodstained fiddle. So let's break this down into smaller bits. First, the killers. Excluding the two jobbers that get killed off by Henry and Jean respectively, in order of their appearance we have a man rich enough to buy a mansion, but not rich enough to get out of Santa Destroy and who doesn't find his life situation unviable, a deadbeat father who works as a corrupt detective, a high schooler obsessed with revenge with no idea who is responsible for her father's death, a postman moonlighting as a cape supervillain, an injured army veteran, a stage magician that gets turned on by his own assistants at the end of the fight, a homeless woman with a huge laser cannon, and a dolled up woman who swings her baseball bat almost as often as she does her mood. There is very little glamour to any of them, and yet Travis wants to claim each of their ranks to get to the top, highlighting just how arbitrary and vapid the entire thing is. And of course, the reason why they are losers is clear. They fell for the same con, possibly for years on end, and believed that the assassin ranking is fully legitimate. And with most of them comes the question of, why did you think violence would solve this? How is killing for money going to help you reconnect with your daughter, or avenge your father, or even grant you any long-term satisfaction? And as for you, Travis, how is violence going to help you get laid? There is a second layer here, as each of them also represents a circumstance that makes violence either socially acceptable, normalized, or at least understandable. Wealth, police work, revenge, cape superheroics, army work, stage magic, homelessness and trauma. Again, disregarding the jobbers. And again, Travis is the final piece here. Because he is not an outsider coming into this world of crazy bloodthirsty characters, but someone that belongs among them. I mean, hell, his last name is Touchdown, he's just as much of an overdrawn persona as any of them. 
and his quest to get some French coochie through the power of incredible violence has been just as normalized. After all, the hero gets the girl at the end of every action movie and game, right? Well, not this time. Sorry, T. Of course, at the very end, it turns out that in his drunken rambling, Travis revealed he actually wanted to take revenge on his ex-girlfriend, Jean, for killing his parents, kinda ending his innocence in one fell swoop. Yeah, that picture of a girl in sundress next to his phone? That's her. So Travis loops back and falls into the stock protagonist's motivation of revenge, same as Shinobu. No wonder she's the only one that survives and even helps him out at the end. As for the non-losers, first we have Sylvia, the woman behind it all, who used Travis for money while also giving him the means to off hundreds of criminals, including some of the most dangerous assassins in the world, and the way to reach his end goal of getting revenge on Jean. In all seriousness, Sylvia is outright fucking heroic in the context of the entire plot, if in a way that a D&D rogue is technically part of the world saving crew. Unsavory means, but positive ends. And she made bank. Then we have Jean, the one character in the plot treated with full gravitas and seriousness, but her story is so dark that it would increase the game's rating, so we have to fast forward through it. Despite being given as much screen time as any other killer, Jean fits into the narrative well and her inclusion feels like a big, proper reveal. And then, finally, we have Sir Henry Motherfucker himself, who is the complete opposite of that, the true final boss in the game, who, at the start of the fight, is just some dude you met once before asking you to beat each other with glowing sticks in the parking lot. A fitting end for a game that, despite its goriness and unnerving atmosphere at times, was essentially child's play until the very last bit. But of course, there's a dark secret to him. For you see, he was Travis's long-lost twin brother and Sylvia's husband all along. Yeah, it's stupid and just as fitting of an ending as the parking lot fight. If the entire build-up to the fight with Jean was arbitrary and silly, it only makes sense that what comes after should be as well. The game oftentimes asks you in between those jokes, why are you even doing this? Travis's answer is twofold, to be the number one and revenge. And for me, as a player to whom this question is also addressed, the answer is also twofold. First of all, because I identify with Travis. Yeah, I said it! I picked this game up because it looked cool. I knew exactly what I'm getting into with the ridicule and loser aura and I still got in. I'm gonna cosplay this man once conventions are morally correct again. It, it's, that's fucking drip! I too have the masculine urge to rent a cheap room to have more money for anime figurines. But the second more upstanding reason is because I want to meet all those weirdos. They're my people. They're cool despite being complete schlops. I want to talk to them. And if violence is the only common language for us, so be it. Still worth it. All those death scenes are somber and tragic because they are a goodbye. But the exchange that happened before them was always magical. Alright, enough of the sappiness. Let's get back to the third class man who skipped this part. Believe it or not, No More Heroes and Disco Elysium are the same game, but distorted by two different perceptions of genre. Could you elaborate on that? No. So, now that everyone is back here, final verdicts on the game. I had a shitload of fun. Yeah, it is technically flawed. Yes, the combat with mooks is repetitive. But I am a child that derives infinite glee from decapitating people with a halogen light bulb, watching the spray of blood, and then suplexing a disabled person into the sand. Do I recommend this game? If anything you saw and heard in this video got you thinking, wow, that's cool, hell yeah! It's the platonic ideal of sitting there wasted with your bodies and talking about the movie, comic book or novel ideas you all had as children, laughing and going, yo, that's sick or that's so fucking stupid, man, at all of them interchangeably while pouring another shot. And there is gonna be some spilling, some dude will inevitably puke, and it will cause you a headache sometimes, but god damn it is it fun. As I said before, it takes about 12 hours to beat. Play on Sweet if you're not confident about your action game skills, there is nothing you'll be locked out of because of the difficulty mode. Punk's not dead, but sometimes they extend the middle finger not towards big concepts like society, history and politics, but their medium of choice. Because the only way to make way for the new is to destroy the old, or at least ridicule it. Huh, maybe this is a kill the past game on a meta level. I know. Too bad there won't be a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right. We're done here, as usual, huge thanks to my Patreon supporters, now visible on the screen. If you like this video, check the rest of my shit out, I covered two other Suda51 games before. I will not stop before I become number one on Twitter, no matter the cost. Why did I say Twitter and not YouTube, I don't know. Uh, next video, I'm working on something related to a certain manga series, we'll see how it goes. See you at the top, fuckheads.